<laughs> All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to what is now the fifth episode of What Did We Learn This Week? This is the show where I share technology tips, tricks, and short lessons that I have provided to my customers over the last year, um, not last year, last week with you. Uh, I'm Jonathan, and I work at Minnesota State Services for the Blind as a technology trainer, and my clients range from low vision to totally blind, and I help them stay independent through the use of technology like computers, tablets, and smartphones. We're recording today on November 6th. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be covering three topics. First, we're going to be uh, talking about a feature called audio messages, uh, where it allows you with an iPhone and Siri to send an audio recording. It's kind of an alternative to a text message. Uh, that's the demo I was having the most trouble with. Uh, so we'll see how that turns out today. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, while we're on the iPhone, we're going to talk about my, uh, my favorite voiceover gesture in the world, the magic tap, why it's called magic and what makes it special. And then uh, I actually had a, 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 a listener submit a question through a phone line here about hosting a Zoom meeting. We're going to talk a bit about like uh, with the Zoom hosting service, which is one of the tools we're using for hosting this is uh, how do you host your own? When do I need to pay money versus using the free service? And uh, I'm even going to do a little demo with a screen reader of how you set up uh, a actual uh, a meeting to host. Uh, and so I've actually pre-recorded part of that. Uh, and then we'll talk about that in, in more detail. Uh, and we're going to do that from the computer side with a screen reader. But of course, if you're low vision, you can follow along with that as well. You're just going to be using the mouse uh, instead of some of the keyboard commands. And at the end, uh, with however much time we have, we'll open it up to for our Zoom attendees to uh, answer some uh, some questions through a, a Q&A session. Uh, now, remember that with future episodes, if you have uh, questions you'd like to ask or topics you'd like us to cover, uh, you can text or call us with those suggestions. And there's a special phone line for that. It's 320-428-0122. I'll say that again one more time slower. That's 320-428-0122. Uh, and you get an answer machine, just leave a message, tell us what you want to learn about and or what you want to talk about, or if you have specific questions, big or small, send it to us that way. Uh, also, if you'd like to join our mailing list and receive an email notification about new episodes and links for getting into old episodes, uh, you can visit the webpage blind.support slash sign up, uh, and then just enter your email address and we will add you to the list. And that web address is blind.support forward slash sign up. So no spaces, all lowercase, no www, although if you put it in there, it doesn't hurt. Uh, it's blind.support slash sign up. And if you've got friends that you think would also be interested in, send them that web page, have them put their email address, and they'll start getting those invites as well. Okay, with that, I think we'll jump right into our first topic. Uh, which is sending audio messages with Siri. So audio messages is actually a, uh, a feature that uh, Apple introduced uh, to the iPhone actually a couple of years ago. Uh, and its idea is you can take a, uh, or send an audio recording to someone rather than having to write a text, uh, a text message out, whether typing it or dictating it. And within the last couple of updates to iOS, uh, they've integrated it quite nicely uh, being able to send one really easily with Siri. Playing it back is still a couple of extra steps and we'll talk about that, uh, but sending one out is particularly easy. We also, just while we're on the topic of, uh, of, of iOS in general, uh, on our last session, we talked uh, about iOS 14 and I mentioned two big bugs that were in iOS 14 for voiceover navigation, specifically navigating by headers in Safari, which is uh, would, would jump around a little bit, which uh, was kind of annoying in a Google search. And there were some issues with navigating the uh, subscription section uh, of, the, uh, of, of the app store. Uh, both those features uh, have been resolved in the last update. In fact, there's been two updates since we did that, uh, that particular episode, uh, which was about three weeks ago, I think now. 
uh, and a lot of those bugs have been resolved. So it's actually not a, it's actually a pretty decent time to, to update uh, it for people who are interested in some of those new features. So just while we're on the topic, I, I thought I would mention that. Uh, and iOS 14 is the feature, is the version that we're gonna want to get uh, the audio, be able to send an audio message with Siri really efficiently. And it's the version I'm gonna be using on my phone uh, today when I do the demonstration. Uh, so audio message instead of text, why would we wanna do that? Well, there's some very, if you've been using Siri to send a lot of text messages, you, you might already be able to figure out the answer to this pretty easily. Siri and the dictation, dictation function on the phone uh, can give you some mixed results sometimes. Uh, sometimes that means that it has a hard time spelling someone's name uh, that you're referring to. Uh, it gets similar, phonetically similar words mixed up. Uh, that can be confusing. It can be embarrassing sometimes. And in the case that you're trying to share information that needs to be perfectly accurate, it needs to be very clear, for example, and uh, you don't want to worry about your dictation being off and having to proofread it or worry that some two phonetically similar words are going to show up and the screen reader is not going to be clear or Siri is not going to read back clearly what it is. You can send an audio recording. So it's almost like sending a, a voicemail message uh, without actually having to ring the other person's phone. So it's like a less intrusive voicemail message, if you will. Uh, and so those are the reasons why you might want to send an audio message. I have a particular friend who finds that because they have an accent, uh, audio, the, the dictation feature itself is not accurate enough sometimes to send a reliable message. So they would send audio messages instead. So these are short recordings and they're sent like a text message. Uh, if you send it to another person who's using an iPhone, uh, the iPhone will actually keep that message. It will play it back the first time you listen to it. And then it will keep it for two minutes. And after two minutes, it'll actually delete it automatically to save space on the phone, unless you go into your settings and messages and tell it to keep it for longer. So the audio messages are a recording of our voice. They're less permanent because they're not meant to be kept on the phones forever. And they allow us to absolutely control what the other person is sending. Uh, I'll give another just fun example of the way it was used uh, is I actually had uh, some nephews send me a happy birthday uh, audio message. And that was more fun because it came out as them singing than Tim just text messaging me happy birthday. Uh, and so that's just another fun, fun use for, uh, for those messages. So what I'm going to do is show you how to send it. And it's setting it's actually pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, I've got my phone here. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to activate Siri on it. And I've got voiceover turned on just for everybody joining us here. Um, you do not have to have voiceover turned on to send a message. It's going to function exactly the same way, except for Siri is not necessarily going to, is going to visually cue you when to speak. So I like having voiceover on because that makes Siri more verbose and is more reflective of the vast majority of the people I'm working with the iPhone on. Anyways, I'm going to activate Siri in just a moment. I'm going to hold down the button on the side. You could also do your Hey Siri command. And I'll tell her I want to send an audio message. Um, I'm going to actually send it to myself. So I'm actually going to say to myself. And she's going to allow me to record a message. And she's going to wait for me to pause or stop at the end uh, to assume that I'm done. So the flow of this is exactly the same as a text message, except for it's an audio recording. Now, after the audio recording is done, I might want to hear what exactly uh, it caught. And so in that case, I could say play, play it back. I'm just going to use the word play to hear it. And then it's going to offer to send it. So I walked you through it. Let's actually do a little demo here. So I'm going to pick up my, uh, my iPhone here. I'm going to hold down the side button to activate Siri and say, send an audio message to myself. Okay, recording. 
Hi, Jonathan. I'm sending myself an audio message. I know this is kind of weird to send yourself a message, and I'm actually kind of surprised that Siri even allows me to do that. But uh, I can just say, send a message to myself. So here we are. Crazy world. Amazing technology. Great. Send it to Jonathan Campbell. Play. Hi, Jonathan. I'm sending myself an audio message. I know this is kind of weird to send yourself a message, and I'm actually kind of surprised that Siri even allows me to do that. But uh, I can just say, send a message to myself. So here we are. Crazy world. Amazing technology. Great. Send it to Jonathan Campbell? Yes. Okay. It's sent. Excellent. So I just sent that audio message. Now I talked earlier about how uh, if uh, if I send it to someone with an iPhone, it keeps it for two minutes. Uh, just to clarify, I don't doesn't have to be an I, an iPhone that I'm sending this to. So it will attach that as an MMS, similar to the way um, if you send a photograph to somebody, they don't have to have the same phone as you. So they'll receive it. So assuming that their phone. Uh, can receive a, uh, a photo or a file sent as a text message. Most smartphones can, and uh, a lot of phones out there, even some of the flip phones can do it. It sends it as a WAV file, which is an audio format that's very standard. Uh, that means that, oh, pretty much any single phone out there can play it back as well. Uh, now, if you send a really long message, the file can get kind of big and some phones don't like that. So I do like to keep these short. So if I receive a message coming back, that's an audio message. There's something a little bit different. I mentioned that sending it is really easy. Receiving it's a little bit different. So if I'm- Can using... I ask a question? Oh, yes, Al, go ahead. Um, what has to be on your iPhone in order to send a message? Do you, is that an email address or is that a telephone number? In your contact? So, Oh, that's a great question. So in order to send it to somebody, you're sending it to someone else, it's using the messages service to do so. So the audio message is part of messages and messages is integrated into your text messages. So if, so to clarify this, um, if to send it to anybody, like, regard, like let's say we don't even know what type of device they have uh, and I want to send them an audio message. Maybe they've got a flip phone. Maybe they've got a smartphone. Maybe it's an iPhone. Maybe it's an Android. I don't know. Um, I would need a phone number for that. No matter what I need, I, I would need a, a phone number and regardless of what they have. Now, if they happen to have an iPad or an iPhone, let's say they can have an iPad and they have an Apple ID, I can use their email address because that will go from my messages app to their messages app. Uh, so unless it's, if it's a, if it's an Apple device, iPad or, or uh, iPad, iPod touch, or an iPhone, uh, I need their email address at least. And if it's not an Apple device, I need their phone number. If they have an Apple device, I can also use their phone number. So phone number or email if it's an Apple device, phone number for everyone else. So just assume, just treat it very much like a text message if you're not sure. And it would be a phone number that we would need because it uses the texting service. And of course, uh, you know, the, it's a great question because we got a lot of different devices out there, and I hope that I hope that was clear. Uh, <laughs> I know it's complicated because you're like, well, if this, then that, and then if not, then this. But if it's a phone number, definitely will work. If it's an Apple device on the other side, an email is also acceptable. I think that sums it up. So, when you receive an audio message like this. Um, let's say I'm, I'm on the iPhone like I'm doing right now, you'll get a notification. My phone currently has do not disturb turned on. That's so that I well, actually my family's texting me as part of a group text text message right now because my nephew drew a picture and texted me a photo and everyone's rating it. And I'm getting like eight or nine texts in a row. So I've got do not disturb on. So I'm not getting notifications during this presentation. But if I had it turned on, I get a notification on the iPhone. Uh, it would it would pop up and would say audio message. Now uh, Siri cannot play back the audio messages. I can't ask Siri just to open the audio messages. I actually have to go into the messages app to play it back. So if I go to notification, you've got an, a message on the phone. You have voiceover on. As soon as it says you've got an audio message, you double tap. 
it'll open the messages app, put you right on uh, that audio message recording, and you just do a one finger double tap again, it'll play it back. Optionally, if you get a notification, double tap on that notification, open it up. You can also just put the phone to your ear and it will play it back uh, as well. And after it's done playing it back, you'll hear another beep and that gives you a chance to send an audio message back. You would, you, you would listen to the message, it would beep and you could say, hey, got your message and then take the phone away and it would offer to send it. That, I, I've noticed that doesn't work perfectly for me all the time. So I always just say, if you get an audio message, the phone gives you notification, just you have to do a one finger double tap, or if you don't have voiceover on, just touch that notification. It'll take you in the messages, put you on that particular message and you play it back uh, with another double tap. If you're on an Android phone uh, or when I use flip phones, it'll show you, you just have to, same thing, you've got to open up the message, go to the messages app uh, and there's an audio file. And usually you can tap, or if you're using TalkBack on Android, double tap, just like on the iPhone, uh, and it will play back that audio message. So uh, like I said, I get a lot of audio messages from a friend of mine who just finds that dictation. It's just so inconsistent for her. This is the way that she sends it back. Um, I would demo the, the playback here, uh, but because I've got Do Not Disturb on, things are a little bit funny right now, and my phone was crashing just a moment ago. So I'm not going to do a full hands-on for that, uh, But you, so just trust me on that open the messages app, it shows up in normal message, but you double tap to play it back. Um, but setting it really easy with Siri. Actually, let me take you in the messages at least. So I'm gonna open up my messages app here. Messages, seven unread messages. I don't have that notification right now, messages. but you'll see. Edit. Conversations, Jonathan, unread, attachment, one audio file, two, 13 p.m. If I had had the notification up, I could have just double tapped on it. I'm actually opening up messages. Here's this one from, from me. I'm going to double tap. Messages. Your iMessage. Audio message. 2, 13 p.m. 16 seconds. Button. Actions and, available. Uh, and here's that audio message uh, that I just recorded here. I'm going to double tap to play it back. What I'm noticing is as a bug is if you send yourself an audio message and then try to play your own audio message back, the phone gets confused. I have no problem listening. My wife sent me uh, an audio message to test this out. But if I try to play this back, yes, my phone just crashed here. And so you don't need to worry about that uh, unless you're sending yourself audio messages. It's the only scenario. And, and so, if, but my wife's really busy. I was going to have her send me an audio message, but uh, uh, she's got a master's in statistics. She does this intense work, uh, you know, so she's, she's busy right now. So um, get a notification, tap on that, and you can play back that voice message. And it plays it back and you can hear the voice recording here. So sorry, that part of the demo is not as exciting, but it does work that way. <laughs> Doc, so, Safari. So that's audio, uh, that's audio messages uh, in Siri. I've been using them a lot more and uh, I've been having uh, quite a few people try it out and I hope you can uh, uh, also, uh, also enjoy it as well. And with that, I'm gonna move on to our next topic, the magic tap. Uh, so the magic tap uh, is a voiceover gesture. So with voiceover, we've got this, the, the iPhone screen reader, if you're not already familiar with it, comes with a lot of gestures. One finger flick right, flick left, lets me navigate through. The phone double tap lets me select it. I've been using a lot of those terms already in the session today. Uh, there is actually you know about a dozen or so gestures. Uh, and some of them you can get through the entire phone and never ever need to use. Uh, for instance, a uh, three finger uh, double tap mutes the voiceover voice. And that's particularly useful if you are a, um, uh, if you are a braille user and uh, hard of hearing and you're not, and you're using a braille display instead of the audio feedback, for example, but most people are never going to actually need to use that gesture here. So, uh, but I do have a couple of favorite ones. And there's one that I really think is essential uh, that I think was overlooked. And it's got a funny name. It's called the magic tap. So the magic tap as a gesture in voiceover is when we take two fingers, like making a peace sign, and we double tap quickly on the screen. So it's two fingers, tap, tap, peace sign, tap, tap. And that 
If you go into Apple's documentation, you go into the voiceover settings and go to the gesture section, you're gonna see this listed as, a, as the magic tap uh, because it does different things depending on what's going on on your phone and it is a great shortcut and it's important to master and it might and even if you know about it already it might do things you didn't know it could do and so that's why i wanted to talk about that today so at the heart of uh of uh, this gesture the meaning is rough is typically i should say start and stop so for example, if the phone is ringing and I want to answer it, I can take two fingers with voice over on, double tap the screen, it'll answer the phone. Two finger, double tap to hang up. It means I don't have to look at the screen. I don't have to do any flick gestures. I don't have to know what's there. Two finger, double tap, answers the phone and hangs up. It also can be used to play or pause music playing from the any of the pretty much any of the music apps apple music pandora uh iHeartRadio. um I'm driving me crazy i'm missing the one that's a green logo uh spotify for example uh it can start and stop audiobooks through the kin uh, uh, the kindle app or apple's audio uh, apple's books app it can start and stop podcasts and if you have a video playing like a youtube video or or uh, 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 Netflix, for example, it'll start and stop those videos. Uh, and it can even start and stop recording in the voice memo app, have you ever gotten into that? So at its core, that's the way most people know how to use it. In fact, let me show you what I mean. Uh, now I found out right before I started here, I was gonna play some classical music in the music app and then I found out because of uh, copyright issues, that's actually blocked, even though I've got this cable logged in here. Uh, and so um, I'm not going to do that specific example in the music app. Uh, so you're just going to take my word for that one. I might unplug this one when we reach the end and actually do that demo. But instead, I'm going to use another great app that if, uh, if we're low vision or blind is very useful to know about, and that's the Bard mobile app. And we'll probably cover that as a, as a future topic here. Uh, so the Bard mobile app uh, gives us access to audiobooks. So I'm actually going to open that up. Open Bard mobile. Uh, and I've got open okay. here. Uh, a, uh, I've already searched through the Bard mobile uh, audiobook collection and I've downloaded 1984. I thought that was an appropriate one for technology wise right now. Uh, and uh, I'm in the app. I'm actually in the section for playing back the, uh, an audiobook. Uh, and so all I need to do to start this is actually take two fingers and double tap. A solitary figure was coming toward him from the other end of the long, brightly lit corridor. It was the girl with dark hair. Stop. So, so I just did another two finger double tap and it stopped playing. What's nice about this is that I'm doing this all from the, uh, from the app inside the now reading section. But if I leave the app, the audiobook will actually start pl keep playing and I can do a two fingers double tap and start and stop it without having to open the app back up again. So because this is the most recent thing playing, this becomes what the two finger double tap does. If the phone starts ringing, now that's what the two finger double tap happens. And then when the call is over, it goes back to uh, starting and stopping this audiobook. So that's why we call it the magic tap because it magically does whatever's appropriate at the moment. Um, now there are some special uses for this as well. There are some apps that have chosen to reroute the magic tap to do special functions. Um, so the two most prominent ones are ones that I think you might run into is for instance, if you are using your iPhone or iPad and you are on a, if you're on this Zoom call, for example, or any Zoom call, a two finger double tap on the screen with voiceover on will unmute or mute your microphone. So it's a shorthand for muting and unmuting. Very useful if you're in a meeting and you wanna, for instance, unmute to ask a question and then mute again when you're done. Uh, so it replaces the start and stop with a new function. 
The other most high profile app to replace the two finger tap with something else is Facebook. And Facebook does it this way because they kind of, if you've used voiceover a handful of time in Facebook, they kind of follow their own rules. Uh, and they've replaced a handful of the voiceover gestures with what they think they should do. So for better or worse, and whether you like that or not, adds up to you. But what it does in Facebook is if you are uh, on the iPhone and you're flicking to the right and you're going through posts, and you're reading about different posts and you hear posts and you're like, ooh, I wanna quickly like that, for example, you do a two finger double tap and it opens up a quick menu that allows you to do things like like, comment or react to a post quickly. So Facebook has its own version of the magic tap function. Zoom has its own version. And anywhere else you think it might work, the two finger double tap will start and stop things. Now there is one, uh, one exception to that uh, that is worth noting because it's an app that we've talked about. And that's the radio talking book app as it live streams. That app is made in coordination with a, a tool that makes it available. So the developers can make an Android and an iPhone version all together. That one does not support the two finger double tap at this point so far, but it is a pretty simple and straightforward app to use. Uh, so I don't think it's a it's a it's a a huge problem. But I just wanted you to know, since that was something we spent a bunch of time talking about previously, this particular gesture does not work. So that's the magic tech. It's context sensitive. What it does depends on what app is open or what audio is playing, and we just do a two finger double tap to to uh, to start and stop things. And here, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, oh, that's that's the other thing I wanted to talk about here. Is Lift let's say. Messages. I am went back to the home menu on mine. Let's say we're not playing an audio book. We don't have a phone call coming through. Uh, nothing in particular seems to be happening on the phone. And we do the two finger double tap. What is the phone going to do? So I'm actually gonna force quit. I'm doing the app switcher, uh, app switcher mobile, here, active. three fingers Actions click up. Messages. I'm just doing that so Bard messages. Mobile is no longer. Messages no longer a, uh, a, an active application here. So, and I'm gonna unplug my phone here. So you're gonna lose the visual here. If I do that two finger tap. Oh, it's not gonna do it for me here today. Um, Music. When in doubt, what I was trying to demonstrate here is when in doubt, a two finger double tap will start and stop music. The last music that's been played on the phone. So I thought it was going to do Music. this. Adding not found. Oh. Album artwork image. Well, it's not going to do it for me right now, of course. But uh, like I said, I was having some weird technical problems before this. But in the event that it doesn't know what to what to do, it'll always default back to music. And so we'll start playing uh, whatever the last thing you played in the music app is. And if you have never really used the music app, uh, you might think, well, there's probably nothing in music. But if you have been a iPhone user for a long time, uh, Apple, whether you liked it or not, gave you a free album. This was maybe six years ago. So if you've been a long time iPhone user, uh, then you might have this. Uh, it's a, uh, a song, an album from U2 that they gave to everybody who had an Apple device for free. Uh, and like I said, whether you liked it or not, it was on your phone. And so I've had some people do that two finger double tap and it starts playing a song from that album and they go, I do don't know idea where the song is coming from. It's because you've been an iPhone user for a while. You get this album for free. It's in music. You did a two finger double tap. Nothing was going on. So the phone goes, well, there's no audiobooks playing. There's no podcasts playing. There was no, nothing going on. But you just asked to play something. I'm going to go into music and play the, play whatever I find there. In that case, it happens to be uh, uh, the first song in this U2, U2 album. Or it could be a song that you've bought before. It's not. So just to explain, uh, if you do it by accident, that's sometimes, that's sometimes what happens. So that's the... Uh, uh, that's the, uh, the the magic tap in a nutshell here. All right, so let's talk about hosting with Zoom. So right now, 
if you're attending this here, I am actually broadcasting from my home office using uh, the Zoom video conferencing software. Uh, and if you're attending with our YouTube viewers over here, um, Zoom actually does have a way of broadcasting uh, into, uh, into YouTube. So I'm taking advantage of all of that. Uh, Zoom is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it's like to host or choose to be a host of a Zoom meeting, like what we're doing right now here. So Zoom is a, you know, as I mentioned, is a, it's a, associated heavily as a free video conferencing program. It's used by schools, uh, used by professionals, uh, and some people are using it just at home to be able to chat with groups of people as we're all kind of trapped inside for COVID. And as we move into the winter and numbers get worse, we're going to be doing more and more Zoom stuff probably. Um, I mentioned that uh, Zoom is associated as being free, but it's actually uh, a partially free service. And what I mean by that is uh, Zoom actually has multiple uh, accounts. And so if you want to host, so to join a meeting, you don't have to be a member. You, you do have to use the Zoom app or the Zoom software on your computer, but you don't have to have an account. You don't have to give them your email address. Anyone can attend as long as the host, the person who schedules that first meeting has sent out an invitation to everybody. So if you want to be a host, there's two main type of accounts for us to deal with. Now there are special accounts for businesses, but we're gonna be talking about for more personal use or for, uh, for friends, for family, and for small groups uh, that you might be coordinating yourself. We're talking about groups that are under a hundred people. And I think that's gonna to apply to um, pretty much everybody who's, uh, who's attending this. I don't think anybody's doing any groups larger than that. If you're doing more than a hundred people, uh, then you do want to go to the Zoom page and they have counts that go up to 300 to 500, much, much bigger groups. And so they have two main accounts. So the first one they have is called a basic account or a free account. And the basic account lets you have up to 100 participants, even though it's just a free account. And if you're meeting with just two people, so just two people meeting back and forth, sort of like you might do with a FaceTime call, just two people. Those meetings are unlimited. There's no time limit whatsoever. But if you're doing a group meeting, so that means three or more people, typically they limit the length of the meeting to 40 minutes. Now that's actually not true right now. Uh, due to COVID, they're running a promotion and they've been running it for months now uh, that they're not holding that 40 minute limit uh, right now, but at some point they're going to stop. Uh, they're going to stop that and 40 minutes is going to be the maximum length for a single meeting right now. There's no limit. And so you could hold a nice long, uh, a nice long meeting uh, for free, but just keep in mind, that's probably only be relevant for the next couple of months. So as we move into spring um, and if you're still using zoom meetings, you might have to upgrade. And so they also provide what's called a pro account. And the pro account is either $15 a month or about $150 a year. And that's similar to the account we're using right now. I'm actually using an account done through uh, the state of Minnesota. So we do have like a, a, like a more of an enterprise account, uh, but the, we're not doing anything you don't get from the free, from the $15 account. So for $15, it's about $15 a month, or if you pay for a year, it's $150. Same thing, 100 participants, no meeting length limitation. Like I said, the basic, there isn't currently a limitation, but there will be. Uh, but there's no limit on the length of your meetings. And the other thing you get is what I'm using right now. I'm streaming this to YouTube, so people who can't join with uh, Zoom can still join. You can also do this with Facebook Live. You need to have a paid account for that. The other thing that's different is with a free account, everyone has to connect with computer audio. So if they need to use their smartphones or they need to use a computer or a tablet in order to really join and, uh, and, and be able to hear the audio. Um, with the pro account, we also get the option, which I'm providing, for people to call in. In fact, we've got people using the call in 
today. So that means they don't need to have a smartphone. They don't need to have a tablet. They can just call into a phone number and hear the audio and participate from the meeting. So a $15 account gets you unlimited length. It gets you phone calls, a phone call uh, number to free people to call into and the ability to stream it online. So which one you use depends on what you're doing. If you're working with a small group right now that's meeting in uh, uh, a virtual in the virtual space, just because we're trying to keep everyone safe because of COVID, it's probably good to just stay with the basic account. If you have people that need to call in with a phone or you intend to do this for a long term, that's when I try to look at the, uh, the, uh, the pro accounts. Now, I mentioned there are business accounts. There's two other types of business accounts. Uh, they're quite a bit more expensive. They increase the number of participants. Um, one even provides a transcription uh, service, uh, which, is, uh, which is nice. So you have everything that was said during the meeting uh, written out. I will say the transcription service is computer generated. So it kind of like Siri, it does make a lot of mistakes, but it's nice. It's more of a reference than it is something that I would consider an accommodation for uh, hard of hearing or deaf. Deaf, you should really get uh, a, a proper transition service or, or, uh, or cart services. We're not gonna get into that today, uh, but those are services where you have a transcriber who write everything, do closed captioning on the screen, and then provide a transcript at the end. That's human led, so it's a lot more accurate. So you decide, okay, I'm gonna be the host. I'm gonna host my group. We're gonna play a board game. We're gonna get together for the holidays. Uh, we're gonna have my own discussion group. I wanna emulate what Jonathan's doing. I wanna do my own tech show. Um, I wanna schedule a meeting. So. Uh, I have recorded, and we're going to play back this similar to one of our demos before, an example of how exactly, what's the process for um, hosting or setting up or scheduling an appointment in Zoom. Now, there's a lot of, now, we're not going to go over what it's like to attend a Zoom. We've talked about that before. There's a lot of resources for attending a Zoom. Keyboard commands, how to do it. If you Google it, you're going to find lots of different options there. But for this demo, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the actual part of scheduling. I'm going to be doing this on a Windows computer, and we're going to be using JAW, the JAWS screen reader. Uh, now, just because we're doing a Windows and a JAWS version doesn't mean that this isn't going to tell you exactly how to navigate and do this with a Mac uh, as well. And so I'll, uh, when we come back after the PC demo, I'll talk about if you're on an Apple computer, how you might do that. Um, and so with that, I'm going to uh, start that demo. All right. So here's my quick tutorial on how to host a Zoom meeting uh, on a Windows computer, and we're going to be using the screen reader JAWS for this, although the keyboard commands and process is exactly the same for any other screen reader like NVDA or even Microsoft Narrator. So we're going to assume, first of all, that we have the Zoom client or program downloaded and installed, and you can get that at zoom.us, of course. And when we open up uh, Zoom and we log in, uh, with our account, we're brought up to uh, the screen here, which is broken up into some different sections. We're going to be sticking with a section called Home. And as we navigate through Zoom, you're going to find that there's this tab section at the top. And in fact, we're going to be using the tab key itself to do most of our navigation in Zoom. So first, I'm going to press the tab key once now that we're open in Zoom. Home tab check selected to switch pages. Press control plus page down. And I'm brought to this home tab. We can actually navigate through this with the left and right arrow keys. There are four different sections, such as chat and meetings, which has a list of all of our scheduled meetings and contacts where we can add in an address book to send out for regular invites. We're going to stick to the home section because we're going to, we can do everything from there. And this is a good starting point here. So I'm going to keep tabbing here. We're going to see that there's a search where we can search through our scheduled meetings, a account tab to make adjustments to our accounts, and a settings tab, which is a good place to go to set up your microphone and camera and monitor all those things. We're not going to be going into those in detail. So I'm going to be tabbing until I get to the first option for starting a meeting, which is simply the new meeting button here. So I'm going to press tab a couple times, and you're going to hear us navigate. 
Search edit. Type in text. Zoom. Jonathan Campbell. Status. Setting button to activate. Press space bar. Starting a new meeting with video on button to activate. Press space bar. So we've moved ourselves to a section of four buttons that are very prominent and very large on the screen uh, near the middle left-hand side. And the first one is this new meeting. If I wanted to quickly start an impromptu meeting, I could hit this button. There's no schedule. It just immediately starts up a, a meeting and there's a way to send an indict from there. We're going to schedule a meeting and run it. Although when we go to run that meeting, I'll show you what you would have done uh, if you made an impromptu meeting to quickly send out an invite for that. So we're not going to be doing the new meeting. And if we press tab again, you're going to hear there's some more options. New meeting option button drop down. And that allows us to choose things like when we start the new meeting, should the video be going, et cetera. We're not going to be doing that quick meeting right now. We're going to be tabbing to schedule. But before we get there, when I press tab, you're going to hear join button to activate press space bar. A join button. And if we use this join button, we have to type in the meeting ID and password of the meeting that we want to attend. This is what we do if the link that's been sent to us uh, is not working for some reason. We can manually type in the meeting ID and the password. I'm going to keep tapping one more time to schedule button to activate press space bar schedule because most of the time when we're hosting a meeting we know we're going to be doing it ahead of time and we're going to be scheduling something so i'm going to go ahead and hit the space bar to choose schedule space schedule meeting topic jonathan campbell zoom meeting edit jonathan campbell zoom meeting type and text all right it immediately opens up a new window where i can start to enter in my meeting information and it even starts with the name of the meeting and it gave it a name based off of my account name, but I'm gonna change this and I can actually just begin typing. I'm gonna call this a practice meeting. So I'm just gonna type in P-R-A-C-T-I-C-E -E, space practice and M-E-E-T-I-N-G practice meeting. All right, so I just typed in practice meeting and to navigate through the rest of this, we're mostly gonna be using the tab and the arrow keys. So when I tab the first option I'm gonna to get to is choosing the date. Start day Friday, November 6th, 2020, 11 a.m. button drop down. And you'll see I get a drop down menu that begins with the current date. Now I could try to open this drop down menu with the space bar, but I recommend continuing with the tab key. As I tab through, I'm going to have the option to change the month, then the day, and then the year. And then, uh, and then I find it's easiest to do that with just the arrow key. So if I tab again here, Month November edit spin box to set the value. Use the arrow keys or type the value. All right, I'm on the month here. If I wanted to change this, I could press the up arrow key. Blank month December edit spin box. You might hear blank and you're going to hear that a couple times, but uh, you'll notice it then picks it up Sunday, December here. So we're actually going to schedule this meeting for today when we're recording it. So I'm going to press the down arrow to go back to November. Blank month November edit spin box. And I'm going to tab to move to the day. Day six edit spin box to set the value, use the arrow keys. I can once again use the arrow keys, or you can also just type in the number. So if I wanted to put this to 15th, I would just type 15 and then tab again. Year 2020 edit spin box. There's the year, same thing. I could use the arrow keys or type in the year manually. If I wanted to do this next year, I could type in 2021, for example. And I've got the, uh, the date. So the next thing is what time is it going to happen? So I'm going to press tab again. Start time, 11 a.m. button drop down. All right, I've got the start time. And just like the start date, I'm going to keep moving through. I'm going to press tab. Hour 11 edit spin box. Here's the hour, and I can use that up and down arrow keys. Alert, 12 p.m. Alert, 1 p.m. Alert, 2 p.m. You notice it says alert uh, as I move through, but it does read the time. It's sort of like the blank. You can ha just ignore that. Uh, I could also type in a number here. So let's say uh, I want to do a... Uh, 11 a.m. Alert, 1 p.m. Alert, 12 p.m. Alert, 11 a.m. Hour 11 edit spin. I could just use the up and down arrow keys till I get to the time that I want. If I wanted it at 11.30, I would tab. Minute 00, zero edit spin. Here it says minute, but it actually means minute. I can use the up and down arrow keys or I can type a number. So if I wanted this 11.30, I could type 3. 3, alert, 11.30 a.m. I just typed 3.0. said alert, 11.30 a.m. Well, that's correct. So I'm going to tab again. Amended spin box. The amended spin box. 
it's AM. It's trying to pronounce AM here. I could use the up and down air case to change this to AM or PM. What I like to do instead is when we're on the arrow, uh, I mean, not on the hour, on the hour option is just to press the up and down and that will move. Once you get past, if you're in the AM, you press up enough times, it'll switch to PM. And I just find that's easier to read. So we've got the setup at 1130 AM using my arrow keys and my numbers. I'm going to keep tabbing. Duration combo box left parent hour right parent to change the selection use the arrow keys. So now I'm in the duration section. How long do I want this to work? And in this case, I like to use the down arrow to move through this. Schedule meeting list box one hour to two hours, three hours. And I'm going to set this to actually one hour. Two hours, one hour. So I'm just using the up and down arrow keys. Now in this case, uh, I am using this like a, a pop up box. I like to press enter. Enter zoom duration combo box left parent hour right parent to change the selection use the arrow key. Uh, to commit that, I'm going to tab to move to the minutes. Duration combo box left parent minutes right parent to change the selection use the arrow keys. Once again, we can use the arrow keys up and down to change this. Schedule meeting list box 45 minutes to move to an item. Press the arrow keys. Well, we've got set at one hour, and I want it one hour exactly. So I'm going to keep pressing the down arrow. I mean the up arrow. 30 minutes, 15 minutes, zero minute. Until I'm going to set it to zero minutes, I'm just going to press enter to commit that. Enter zoom duration combo box left parent minutes right parent to change the selection. Use the arrow keys. Now, honestly, you can set this duration to anything you want uh, and run the meeting as long as you want. So if you set this to just be one hour, but the meeting goes an hour and a half, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to stop you. This is just something that's going to show up. Uh, as it uh, as it puts in your schedules, to, in your calendar, and it is something to just give some guidance to the attendees, but it is not something that restricts the actual length of your meeting here. So now we're going to keep tabbing here. We're going to have some options like, is this a recurring meeting that happens? And we could pat, uh, hit space on that and make this something that happens once a month, for example. And it's also going to ask us about the time zone. It's going to set it to our current time zone. So usually we don't have to change that. So let's tap through and listen to those. Recurring meeting checkbox not checked. The check press space bar. All right, we're going to leave that unchecked. Time zone colon combo box left parent GMT dash six o'clock right parent. All right, it's set it up for central time. That's my time zone here. We're going to tap again. Meeting ID generate automatically radio button checked. We have an option for the meeting ID. Normally, it will generate an automatic meeting ID, a unique number for each of your meetings. You don't have to worry about what that is because when you send out the invite, it's going to add the meeting ID for you. Now, this is a, uh, a bulleted list here, and I can actually use the left and right arrow keys to change this, and I can use my personal meeting ID. That'll give me the same number for every meeting. If you're doing a repeated or recurring meeting, that's not a bad idea. We're not going to go into great detail with that, but for the most part, you can choose to generate automatically. And we've set up the invite. It's going to handle all of those meeting IDs numbers for us uh, without us having to worry. So I'm going to press tab again. Passcode VRM41D edit. VRM41D type and text. All right. So now I've got the security password. This is the password that someone has to put in if they're manually trying to attend the meeting. Remember that the link that you send out will include the password information in it, uh, and the person won't have to manually enter it in. Unless they have a problem with the link, then they have to type in this passcode. It generates one automatically, and it should be noted that uh, capitalization does matter with these passwords here. I wanted to set it to something a little bit easier, maybe a numbered password rather than a combination of letters, uh, uppercase, lowercase letters, and, uh, and numbers. I'm just going to backspace through that to remove that password, and I'm going to type a new one in. D14MRV blank. All right, I've got that uh, uh, passcode emptied here, and I'm actually going to use a group of numbers instead. Three, four, six, three, two, one. There we go. So that's a much easier passcode in case someone needs to type it in. It's also easier for someone to guess if someone's trying to break into your meeting, but Honestly, it's probably uh, a low a low threat unless uh, uh, unless someone specifically is targeting you. But I do like to have a passcode in there. In fact, they, they usually require it. So we've got a passcode in there, knowing that most people are not going to have to type that in. But we set it to something easier. I'm going to press the tab key again to move to the next option. Security waiting room checkbox checked. So now we have the waiting room. The waiting room is the space that when someone attends, they don't immediately join the meeting. They end up in the waiting room, in the participants list in the waiting room. 
and the host has to allow them in. For this particular meeting, the one that you're attending, if you're attending this on Zoom, we did not have a waiting room. When you attend, you immediately join into the meeting. But this is an extra level of security so that if somebody uh, gets a copy of your link, for example, who's not supposed to be part of the meeting and they're trying to jump in and, and join and interfere in some way, uh, you would have the ability to uh, basically block them from coming in by not allowing them in. Uh, we're going to turn off the waiting room in this case uh, so that the invitees can join uh, because I have uh, some good trust on the people that I'm sending it to and we can always boot someone off if they do attend. Uh, but this is a good thing to know about and it is an extra layer of security. So I'm going to press the space bar to uncheck this. Space not checked. Excellent. So a couple more options and we're almost there. So if I tab again. Video host colon off radio button checked to change the selection press up or down arrow. So I've got a radio button for video for the host. This is saying when we join, when I start this up as the host, well, I have my, my video on by default. Video host colon on radio button check. Video host colon off radio button check. And I just press the arrow keys to adjust that. I'm going to set the host to on in this case. So I'm going to press the down arrow. Video host colon on radio button. Very good. And now I'm going to tab to the next field. Video participants colon off radio button checked. So when a participant joins, will their video be on by uh, automatically? Of course, the participant has their own control over the video, but it's just sort of the default for this. Uh, we're going to leave this one off and allow the attendees to choose for themselves to turn on the video. So if I tab one more time. Calendar, other calendars, radio button checked. To change the selection, press up or down arrow. I have the calendar option. And I can up and down arrow keys to choose between Outlook, Google Calendar, and other. So basically it's saying when I make this uh, schedule this meeting, would I like it to add it to one of my calendars and what method will we use? Now, I don't actually intend to add this to my calendar. So I'm going to choose other. Uh, if you are using Outlook and you choose Outlook, it will automatically open Outlook and add it to your calendar, which is another way that you can send out an invite to the meeting. We're going to stick with other. We're going to keep it basic here. Now, the next option is advanced options, and we're not going to go into that particular option today, uh, but it does have some additional choices like can attendees uh, join before the host does and, and some other checkboxes there. They're pretty self-explanatory, so we're not going to go into them right now just due to time. So I'm going to keep tabbing. Advanced meeting options, save button. To so I finally get myself to the save button. I'm going to press space to save this meeting. Space, schedule meeting, zoom dash schedule meeting. The meeting has been scheduled. Zoom, your meeting has been scheduled. Click the button below to copy the invitation to clipboard. Excellent. So now I have my meeting uh, invitation here. Next, if I press tab once. Jonathan Campbell is inviting you to a scheduled zoom meeting. Topic colon practice meeting time colon nov 6, 2020, 1130 a.m. And it's going to actually read off that invitation. I've cut it off here a little bit short. Uh, so I can actually hear what my invitation is going to look like. Now I want to be able to send it out. So if I keep tabbing here. Open with default calendar left parent dot x right parent button. That's going to try to open it with my okay. calendar here. Like and I said, I don't want to do it through calendar invite. So I'm going to tab again. Sorry. Copy no, the clipboard ahead. button. And there's a copy to clipboard button. So if I hit the space bar. Space, the talk. invitation has been copied to clipboard. So that means I can now open up my email program, for example, and hit Control V, and it will paste in that invite. It includes my name, the name of the meeting, and a link, the meeting number, and a password. So all I have to do is go to whatever method I'm going to use for sharing this, hit Control V to paste it, and there we have a nice invitation. Uh, now that I've got this scheduled and I got the invitation copied here, I'm going to press the escape key because uh, I'm done with scheduling the meeting. Escape schedule button to activate press space bar. Excellent. So I now have my meeting scheduled and I can now send out that invite. Maybe I'm making a, a Facebook post. Maybe I'm emailing it. Just remember, you just paste it right from the clipboard. And now we're going to pretend it is the day of our meeting, and I want to begin that meeting. So I'm going to open up Zoom, just like we have right now, and I'm going to tap through. You're going to have the same home tab, the search, et cetera. But if you keep going on the day of the meeting, 
on this homepage, the meeting will actually uh, appear. Uh, keep in mind that if we have scheduled this for next week and we open up Zoom today, this meeting is not going to show up in the home section. It's only going to show up in the meetings section. So this particular uh, next set of steps is if it's the day of your scheduled meeting. So I open up Zoom. I tab through. I'm already on the schedule section. So you would tab through the home section, the search button, the account, the settings, new meeting, join, schedule. And then we keep tabbing. Share screen button, share option button drop down. Friday, November 6th, 2020, 10, 27 a.m. Change background image. Practice meeting, 11.30 a.m. dash 12.30 p.m. There's the meeting I scheduled and I can hear. Um, if I keep tabbing through, I'm going to get to a start button. More button to activate, press space bar. Start button to activate, press space bar. And I'm going to go ahead and press the space bar. Space. Zoom. So my meeting is Join now audio. started. Join with computer audio button to activate press space bar. You are in the meeting hosted by Jonathan Campbell with one participant. Your audio is not connected. Your video is on. All right. So we just joined our meeting here. And just like uh, if you're attending someone else's meeting, there's the option to join with audio. Right now, we want to join with computer audio. So uh, I'm going to tap till I hear join with computer audio. Test speaker and microphone, but automatically join audio by com join with computer audio. All right, I'm going to go ahead and press space. Space audio now unmuted. Zoom meeting. You are using the computer audio. All right, and we are officially in the meeting. We can see myself in video. I know I'm right by the window here, so it's not my best video appearance, but here we go. And now I can uh, I can monitor and run our meeting, and I can tab through to get to all our all different options here. We're not going to be going over exactly the steps of, uh, of being in a meeting here. But if we tab through meeting information, enter full screen, mute, audio settings, stop my video, video settings, security button menu, closed, open participants panel, one participants. I get all those different options here. Here's my participants panel. I just tapped to it. I'm going to press space. Space expanded. Participants left. That opens up our uh, participants panel, which is very important if you're the host and, and you are using the waiting room. This allows me to tap through, see the participants, and then if someone has uh, attempted to join and they're waiting in the waiting room, I can tap to uh, to the button to actually allow them into the meeting. If you haven't set up the waiting room, then people will just join uh, and you don't have to worry about that. So I can use all my keyboard commands. When I'm done with the meeting, uh, I'm just going to close the window. So I'm going to use my Alt F4. Alt F4, end meeting or leave meeting. An option comes up when I want to end the meeting for everybody, so everyone's cut out, or do I want to just leave the meeting? If I leave the meeting, uh, potentially everyone else could continue to run it. But I'm the host. I want to end this, so I'm going to press tab. End meeting for all button. Here's my end meeting for all. I'm going to press enter. Enter. Zoom meeting. Start button to activate. Press space bar. And I'm back in my original Zoom home menu here. So that is how we can schedule and begin hosting our very own Zoom meeting using JAWS or whatever screen reader we're using. All right. And uh, so that's an example of uh, how to do that on a, uh, on a Windows machine using JAWS. Now, of course, that's not the only way that we can host it. We can host on a lot of different platforms. Uh, if you're on an Apple computer, for example, you can follow those exact same steps. Uh, of course, the screen reader sounds a little bit different uh, in, in voiceover, but it, uh, it basically works the same way. We tab around through the menus to get to things. The only exception that I've really noticed between doing it on a Mac versus on a PC is that, uh, and this is a weird user interface difference, is that as we noticed on the PC one, we set up the start date and time, and then we chose the duration, one hour, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, et cetera. On the Mac version of Zoom, we start this, we use the date and time to set the start time, but then for the end, uh, instead of choosing how many hours, it gives you again, the date and time. So you set the date and time for when you want to begin. And then you get to, when you tap through, you get to the date and time for when you want it to end. So instead of one hour, you would say from two to four, I mean, uh, from two to three, for example. Uh, other than that, it's exactly the same. Uh, you can also 
uh, set up and host it from an iPhone or an iPad or any smart device as well. That's a bit different. When that time we're gonna be using a flick to the right, double tapping to open up menus, and then either filling in using the keyboard or uh, with date and times there's a picker, which basically you double tap and then you flick up and flick down to change that value. Uh, but you can, it's a bit uh, simpler uh, on those uh, devices if you're confident with your screen reader as well. So basically the same, we're just using this, uh, this Windows version because it's one of the more common ones and because it is a pretty solid uh, baseline. So other than that, like I said, the steps are exactly the same. Uh, so that's sort of a, a rough overview of the what type of Zoom accounts there are and a demo of how you might set up and schedule uh, a Zoom meeting. So I hope that gives you uh, some, uh, some ideas and maybe inspires you to start your own Zoom group as well. And uh, uh, with that, I'm going to move us into our Q&A section. So if people have questions about anything that we've talked about today or have additional questions in general they'd like to ask, and I can try to answer that over the airwaves here. Uh, I also understand if we don't have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of questions because it is if you're here in Minnesota it's a beautiful day and we should all probably be outside but uh, <laughs> uh, but if anybody does have any questions uh, feel free to uh, unmute can you hear me down, Dan? and ask yeah I sure can Al okay got a question I've never used Zoom on my iPhone is the app already on the iPhone for instance uh, you know I got the invitation from you. Uh, and I would say I'd see that in my inbox on my phone. And if I went down to the, you know, connect to Zoom and I double tapped on that, would it launch the Zoom meeting on my iPhone? So in order to attend a Zoom meeting, whether it's on the computer or, or on a smartphone, you do need to download Zoom's software first. So if you're on the iPhone, for example, you'd, before you do that, although there's a way of doing it in the process, you'd want to first... Um, you know, like go to the app store, activate Siri, say open, uh, uh, you know, find Zoom in the app store and, uh, uh, and download the app. And, uh, and uh, now, interestingly enough, I didn't have it prepped for today, but it, I, and I, and uh, I had, I made a video exactly of what the process of joining a Zoom meeting is on the iPhone. Uh, and it's actually up on the same YouTube account uh, that we use for what it, we use for these videos here. Uh, and so if you go to, uh, the, uh, I, I, I should have prepped this. It's something I just did for somebody else here. Uh, but if you go to youtube.com, I think you can put it, I'm just testing this out here. No, no, no. If you go to YouTube and you, uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for, uh, it's the same page I'm using for, for this. It's, it's an account called Access Ninja. Access Ninja. You're going to Access Ninja. You're going to find there's a, a video called the AT Bootcamp. It's a new video series I'm working on. And it says attending uh, Zoom with iOS and voiceover. Uh, so, and, and I'll send that out maybe as, as one of the emails as well. So just to kind of recap here, you do need the Zoom app first. So if you did, not have the Zoom app. You open that email, you double tap on that link uh, in the email to attend. First thing that happens is it loads Safari, the web browser. And Safari checks to see if Zoom's on your phone already. And if it is, it then opens up Zoom and, you, and you're attending the meeting. That's it. It's that straightforward. Uh, if you haven't loaded it ahead of time, uh, it'll go to Safari. Safari will see you don't have the Zoom. And if you flick to the right on that page, there's actually a link someone somewhere on there that you can double tap on. That'll take you to the app store to download the app. But I highly suggest downloading it ahead of time first, rather than trying to do it through the Safari link. Just activate Siri, say, uh, search for Zoom in the app store, and then flick to the right. Um, the one thing I say is that it's called, uh, the app is called, um, uh, well, here, let me do it right now. Search for Zoom in the App Store. Okay, searching for Zoom on the App Store. App Store, Zoom, search field. So if you do that, like search for Zoom in the App Store with uh, with VoiceOver, if you flick to the right, you almost always get an ad first. 
clear text button cancel button advertisement google meet to get button advertisement button just keep flicking fast past the ad zoom cloud meetings meet happy four and a half stars one point so it's called zoom cloud meetings and the company that uh runs it is called meet happy which i i didn't know until i until i was doing this demo here uh, and that's the right one you're just going to flick to the right open button i says open for me you can get it um, and just load that on ahead of time. It's really easy to do it on the phone though. Just double tap. Once you've got it loaded on here, double tap on the link. It'll open it up. And uh, it's it really is an easy way to attend. You double tap on the open? Uh, yeah, well, so when I searched through the app store here, uh, I get I had the open because I already have the app. If you oh, follow that step, it's going to say get instead. And you okay. get the double tap on get. And that's just the first time, you know, once you download the app. Uh, all okay, you do once, is once you get the get, mm -hmm. then it, it automatically loads it on your phone. Yeah, it'll, it'll, uh, it will install it on your phone. And then you just go open that email again, like the email invite that I send out. You know, find the, navigate to link double tap and it'll take care of the rest. Yep. The gotcha. first time, the first time you attend a, uh, a Zoom meeting though, you're going to get, three, I think it's three pop-up messages that show up. This is just the first time. And it's the type of thing that Apple does where it pops up and says, Zoom would like to use your microphone. And you flip to the right until you say, okay. And you double okay, tap. Too. They'll say, Zoom would like to use your camera. Because remember, it's a video conferencing. At that okay. point, you can say no if you don't intend to use the camera. But flip to the right and say, okay. And says, so, Zoom would like to send you notifications. You're like, okay, flick to the right and hit okay. And then you're in the meeting. And the next meeting you attend, you don't get any of those notifications. Go straight into the meeting. So uh, to start it, you say, find Zoom in the App Store. That's right. So you start out, activate, activate. So you say, find Zoom in the App Store. Flick to the right to here. Yep, Zoom it. Cloud Meetings. One more time to the right to get, double tap to get the app. Uh, and then if you, and then, like I said, I'll send, uh, I'll send with the next invite out. Or if you, if you go, uh, if you go to youtube.com and search for access ninja, you'll find the uh, attending a zoom with iOS uh, video that I, I posted just like a day ago, uh, which uh, that was one uh, uh, I, I made for, uh, I made as a request. So that was another thing too. If you send us in a question and I don't know if it's going to fit into this, sometimes I'll make a video and just post it and <laughs> post it on YouTube for you. All right. Well, do we have uh, do we have any other uh, any other questions here? I think that was a really good one. And if not, I'm gonna give us just a minute here. I might end us off a little bit a little bit early so we can uh, maybe all get out and enjoy that uh, that I think it's let me check it's 73 degrees here. Uh, we're just, I'm in one of the west. Uh, Minneapolis and the west of Minneapolis and the suburbs here, and it is really nice. But uh, oh, one other question: the link to view past. What did we learn this week? Session. Where's that link? Uh, so um, I sent out uh, through the group uh, um, an, an email on it was Friday last Friday, and, and that one has a uh, in that email. I think I even still have a copy of it here for me to reference. But in that uh, in that email, there is a a, a link to the archived uh, um, that I uh, I included in that email message. Uh, and so you'll find those um, if you um, uh, uh, if you just go to that email. Uh, also, all the archived ones are on the Access Ninja YouTube page. So that's also if you if you search Google YouTube Access. Ninja, you'll find um, uh, you'll find uh, a link to our page, and that one's got a list of all the episodes uh, for you to replay back as well. Um, and uh, and I'll also be sending out um, uh, each to each uh, each time I send out uh, through that email. That's that access, uh, you know, the blind dot support uh, slash sign up uh, for all the future ones. I'll include a link to the archives. Uh, archived uh, episodes in every in every new email that goes out. Because I'm looking, yeah, episode three got quite a few reviews. I'm on the page right now. Uh, that one, that one got uh, 
that what was episode three episode was seeing ai that one's gotten quite a bit of uh, of replay so uh yeah, and we'll keep those up there. And then I, I do hope to actually build a new page for the archive that's going to be a little easier to navigate right now, like the YouTube one. I mean, it navigates fine with uh, with like JAWS and voiceover, but uh, I think we can do a little better than that. So I'm going to post, I'm going to, I am going to give a more clean uh, web interface for that. Zoom's just, I mean, YouTube's just a bit busy um, if you're, if you're trying to navigate with the screen reader. So yeah, you use a lot of heading shortcuts to move through that page because uh, they've just got a lot of links everywhere so and i think the video player is pretty good because it's playing on through youtube so and then if we get enough of these two we're thinking about releasing them just as audio like as a podcast as well so if you're interested in that uh, stay tuned i'm working on trying to just make this easy to get to and very accessible all right well i think we're gonna wrap up for today then thanks for joining us um and uh we'll uh Remember to uh, uh, send any new questions to us uh, or uh, um, at that 320-428-0122. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will, we're going to have, we'll have three more exciting topics uh, next week. And then also, if you're interested, if people want me to do a, a full episode, maybe on Unbarred Mobile, let me know. I'm just curious if there's interest in that or not, like we did for Seeing AI. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to try to keep it to these three smaller topics for the time being. So, But any sort of feedback is, uh, is appreciated. So with that, we will close up uh, for today. Thanks for joining us.